we uh, are now having our panel. So uh, Daniel's here. That's always good to have a moderator. Uh, Paul. So the panel is, uh, is, is discussing that, that those big questions that can never be um, answered, I suppose, but can always be discussed. Um, what to expect from blockchain gaming in 2023? But uh, I think Paul will at least have some, some concrete answers about what he's up to, at least. Hi there, I'm uh, Daniel Griffiths. I'm the editor of PocketGamer.biz, uh, formerly the editor of BlockchainGamer.biz. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm here to ask the, ask, the, ask the big questions as regards blockchain. So, uh, we'll get cracking. Fellas, can you introduce yourself, say what it is that you do, who you are, why you're here? Uh, sure. Uh, hello, everyone. My name's Yasser. I am uh, head of studio at Sansoft Games. Um, I've been in the industry for about 14 years. Uh, worked on various uh, AAA console games, including FIFA, Need for Speed, and also uh, some free-to-play mobile games like Dawn of Titans, CSR Racing, and so on. Um, we at Sansoft uh, are developing a game which includes some NFT uh, elements to it uh, with a, a studio out here in the UK, uh, hence why I am sitting on this panel, I guess, as well. <laughs> Makes sense. Paul, take it away. Hi, everybody. I'm Paul Flanagan. I'm with Creative Mobile. We're a free-to-play uh, game dev um, based in Estonia, and I'm on the corp dev side, mainly, mainly business. The reason I'm here is we started building blockchain games in 2018, did a couple of experimental things, and for the last 18 months, we've been building uh, uh, a drag racing game on the blockchain, which builds on IP, which we've developed over the last 10 years. Hello, and I'm uh, John Jordan. So um, I... Uh uh, I was actually co-founder of Steel Media a long time ago, so, so, so part of the Pocket Gamer founding team, but that was a while ago now. Um, so since 2018, I've been uh, heavily into, into blockchain. I um, actually uh, launched the uh, blockchain gamer.biz. That also seems a long time ago. Um, <laughs> but uh, I also do some consulting. I write a uh, substack uh, called Games TX, which is all about blockchain games. Um, and I'm yeah, yeah, just heavily into the space and very uh, intellectually interested in what's going on. I wouldn't say I'm an expert, but uh, always curious. Pretty close. <laughs> uh, fantastic. Thank you for that, fellas. Um, so the reason we're here, we want to discuss blockchain, the state of play in blockchain in 2023. It feels like it's been a long and strange year, I would say. Things feel different from the, the, this exact spot uh, in, in 2022. What, what, what do you think has changed uh, throughout the year, uh, and, and, and what do you think the state of play is right now? Are we still optimistic for about blockchain? Okay, I'll kick off. <laughs> um, I think with any uh, nascent technology, something that's coming in for the first time, you just got to look back through history to to understand what the what the trends will be. Um, you'll see that it always goes through a period where you have a lot of um, um, less what, nefarious characters, lots of uh, um, well questionable games, um, and and we're still in the midst of that. Um, and there's also, I think, what what kind of makes blockchain a little bit more unique is that you're coming into an environment where you're not introducing something that's brand new to gamers. Um, I think I was seeing the presentation before, pretty much everything you can do in Web 3, you can do in Web 2. And you can, you know, um, pick up any game you want. Now, Ubisoft has been doing it for years where, you know, you've got, they've got their sharing system and you can take things across from Assassin's Creed into a Far Cry game, you can do what you want. So these things exist, which is why you have a lot of people questioning what is the point of it? What is it there for? Um, and I still don't believe that that question has really been um, answered. Like, it's, it's sort of fair to say, yes, you can own something, but, but why? There are millions of gamers who spend billions of dollars a year who are completely fine without owning anything. And so you have to kind of frame it in that way. So I think where we are now is, 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 is pretty much where we were last year, with the exception of two things. One is a lot of the hype is gone, which is allowing people who are genuine about the space to focus on creating games in the space. Um, and then the second is that you don't have that same level of investment, which means that you aren't attracting the same type of people who are looking for a quick buck um, as they would have been last year as well. But I still think we're a way off from any kind of um, mass scale uh, adoption, but that's probably a separate topic. So I think... This time last year, speaking of hype, it was certainly high. And you know, obviously the crypto and um, related NFT markets have declined precipitously since. Uh, but if you talk to players in the market, let's say look at some of the networks like Polygon or Immutable, you know, they are busy 
recruiting Web2 devs and bringing them on board. The time frames they're predicting for us to see these are later this year or next year. So we've been working on a title for 18 months. We've got a 40-person team on it. And I think what people tend to forget is how long it takes to create good games. Um, yeah, some of the earlier games were you know, nefariously set up. Simple games, Ponzi schemes. You mentioned CSR. If you're going to create something at that scale, you need a big team and a long time, a lot of expertise. So in November, I was at GSTAR and met all the big Korean publishers. And I was shocked that they're all into Web3 really heavily, but they're doing it quietly. It's not like some of the bigger, um, say, American um, you know, blockchain companies. They've, they've raised their money or they have it organically and they have existing titles and they're tending to bury the tech inside. So they're not saying this is a blockchain game. It's, it's an MMORPG and if you go in deeply enough, you find out that you have an NFT and you can do something with it. So yes, things look different on the surface, but I think underneath the, the trend is, a lot's happening. Yeah, I mean, I think that's absolutely the case. I, I think the, um, in, in some, maybe it's most just in my mind, when I first sort of actually five years ago at this conference, people started talking about NFTs and, and crypto and blockchain in gaming. And that was very obvious to me because I thought, you know, at that stage we've seen the rise of free-to-play mobile and people were running these massive economies worth billions of, or hundreds, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars just make, made fake, fake money. And I, said, I just thought, oh, it's going to be much easier to have real money, isn't it? That's going to be, uh, you know, simple. Um, and, and clearly it wasn't simple, but clearly I think, you know, that. the... the one of the problems with blockchain is, for those of us in the industry, it is some very clear concepts. And I guess if you've been in these talks today or ones yesterday, there are some very clear things that always come through about ownership and interoperability. And, you know, some of those are closer than others. Um, but then as we sort of dig into it more, the sheer complexity, I think, of what is being, um, of what blockchain brings t potentially to any um, uh, sort of consumer facing um, industry, but particularly for games, it's just so complicated. And then you have that attached clearly to whatever's going on in crypto, which is, you know, just another thing entirely. I mean, the, the amount of, um, you know, not something probably most of us in the room, you know, uh, touch, but the amount of, sort of just trading velocity going on in places, you know, like, you know, um, particularly in Southeast Asia. Um, it's just, you know, it's obviously totally unrelated to what's going on in gaming, but also totally related <laughs> to what's going on, totally impactful on what's going on in gaming. So you have these just incredibly sort of complex things going on. Um, actually, so, and I think definitely last year, everyone went through a bit of a, um, existential sort of <laughs> what's going on here um, from from sort of May through to uh, you know the end of November with FTX. Um, my sort of view was always FTX was sort of the end point of of that contagion that that sort of happened. Uh, maybe I'm too optimistic. But going back to Paul's point, the thing that I've always been struck with is you know over the last uh, two years, I think it's about twelve billion dollars have been invested into the space, not purely into games, but sort of metaverse, NFTs, that sort of stuff. So just a lot of money's gone in there. Obviously, most of that will be wasted, but there's a lot of good projects in there and it just takes people a year to 18 months to get those projects out and because I this is the sort of thing I do I have a really big list of blockchain games about 800 blockchain games um, that are in development or live and I have as well as a tab there I have like 40 or 50 which I think are like most my most anticipated games and pretty much they're all bits of those games are all going live at the moment so it's like Paul's lot that's going live on the App Store. You know, that's fully going live. A lot of the games are sort of like, well, this is in a sort of closed alpha or open beta or, you know, and blockchain games are very much like this sort of um, salami slice sort of product. You get a little bit and then a little bit more and a little bit more. But there are a lot of very experienced teams who have raised a whole bunch of capital. I mean, even just this week, um, uh, Jam City, they're doing this game called uh, Champions Ascension and they've just sort of spun out a company from that, raised $32 million. It's a really interesting sort of product. And I just kind of think, it's not the fact that there's so many games coming out, something has to stick. I hate that as an analogy, but there are so many experienced companies who know how to make good games because they've been working in the space for you know, a decade. And they're all doing sort of something slightly different. Um, and just you know, from a personal level, I just think there's a lot, you know, you always kind of say in the games industry, you never had so many good games because you always have all the old ones and all the <laughs> sort of new ones are coming. But I, th I think there is definitely a trend where, from a sort of media point of view, the next six to 12 months will just be, oh, this blockchain game's just come out, it's amazing, or this blockchain game's come out, it wasn't very good, or, but it's just the, head, the, you know, the headlines are going to be a whole bunch of blockchain game stuff coming out. And I think that will be an interesting sentiment because that won't be pe people talking necessarily about what's the price of Bitcoin, and I think that'll be a different narrative. And you sort of have, you know, we had DeFi summer in 2020, and then you sort of, oh, that now it's NFT summer or NFT, whatever it was, you know. So, so people like to have put a narrative around what's going on in blockchain, and I just, I'm not saying it will be sort of a, the gaming summer or something, but I just think there will be an awful lot of 
sort of narrative around good products coming out, and that will that will hopefully shape um, the, the broader ecosystem as well. Yeah, it's, it's, it certainly feels like there's a lot of kind of shady practices that we're glad to see the back of. I think I think there's certain things have fallen by the wayside over this last year, and I think we kind of all agree that, to the, yeah, we don't want them to return. What kind of thing are we seeing less of? What kind of thing do we not want to come back into the blockchain space? I think the, the demise of, of play to earn is a great thing. You know, when I, when I saw the way that Axie was structured, which seemed to be kind of a throwback to medieval serfdom, I thought we probably don't want to recreate that. So, because you had a network of people with money who were employing people at almost slave wages, not good. Paul, I, I, I'm going to step in there. <laughs> no, I mean, I absolutely disagree on every level with that. Um, so, I mean, the one interesting thing I think was, and in some ways, you know, people who know me, I, I often bore people saying, is, is, it a, you know, is it a feature or a bug? And I kind of think with Axie Infinity, what happened was, you know, they didn't do any marketing at all. They built an ecosystem, and it showed the power of blockchain assets where basically a whole bunch of people in fact, Guild sort of built multi-layer marketing around that asset. And it wasn't, you know, I think Sky Mavis were as surprised as everyone. <laughs> that game went from literally 10,000 DAUs to 3 million or 2.5 two and and million. And it had nothing to do with anything Sky Mavis did. It was the wider ecosystem and, again, what was going on with crypto. Um, so, which so, which, but, 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 which, which, which I, I, I see that. I accept that. But what was worrying was how everybody else jumped on top of that. I remember I was reading through LinkedIn and some VC I know said, he was just describing that. He said, I want more of this. You know, come to me. And yeah, maybe you're right, but people embraced it. I mean, I mean one, going back to what we, I think, want to see less of and are seeing less of, and it sort of underpins what you're saying about Axie as well, really. And they were the first one to do it, to sort of create these tokens. And no one had really, at a game at scale, had created these sort of crypto assets that actually people cared about. You know, became like a general, you know, they became a big thing in the, even if you weren't playing Axie, people were speculating on, on this as a crypto asset. And I think what we've definitely seen um, is people don't launch, people don't launch, launch tokens ahead of a game coming out because everyone's been burnt on that. As we saw in the last talk, you know, most games I don't think need a token. Um, you know, I think you, tokens are brilliant, but you, they only work if you have an economy that is already up and running and has the potential to be worth tens of millions of dollars. You know, you need, you need that to be there before you launch a token. And I think what we are seeing now is people not launching tokens until their games come out or even doing things. So Big Time is a really good example of this where they have a token um, and actually have NFTs, but you, you don't buy those from the developer. Basically, gamers go and f play the game and they are generating the assets by playing the game. So in the case of uh, big time, their um, cosmetic items are basically dropped when you complete boss battles. So they're not selling those. P people are playing the game, and the better the bosses you attack and defeat, the better the cos cosmetic NFTs you get, and then you can sell them on. So that's, I mean, quite a, you know, th there's no way you can speculate that because there's no, it's, you know, this wasn't sold at $100 and now it's $1,000 or $10 because it's just worth nothing, and then the player base does that. And I think that's very holistic, and I think that will be what is seen as sort of best practice. Um, hopefully, I think. Shady, shady stuff that we're glad to see the back of. What, what, what do you think? I mean, what, and what's your take on, on, on play to earn? As well? um, we did a, a sort of internal review, I think it was last year, November time, like, well, actually, tw yeah, 2020 November, where we were thinking about entering the space. And the one, you know, there are a number of push and pull factors that I think have caused that the kind of hype. One of them is UA is a lot harder, and you know Web3 seems like a more level playing field where it doesn't matter if you're EA or if you're you know a 10-person startup, you've got the same kind of understanding, which is probably zero. <laughs> um, and uh, that that helped because it was like, oh, this is a new area of growth because we're seeing a little bit of sort of you know uh, um, uh, a sort of staleness there. But um, I mean, from from hearing the sort of conversation here and and, and the sort of discussion, um, Sky Mavis will go down as as or, or you know Axie Infinity will go down in the history of uh, of sort of gaming when you look back at it ten years as being a seminal game. Whether it's good or bad, there's plenty of good and bad in it. Um, but it 
it will still go down as a sort of catalyst for that sort of change. But the more that I'm hearing the guys talk, the more I'm realizing that the trend is just make good games. <laughs> like I don't, it's, 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 you know, all this stuff about like dropping loots and doing, doing all this sort of stuff. You just got to go back to, to sort of how gaming is. One thing I really don't like though, is the dismissive nature with which people refer to web 2.0. Like it's so old school, <laughs> like it's so out there. It's like a wits or dinosaur would play those sorts of games. A lot more than a playing web three, that's who. So, and, and we'll be, for a long while as well. So that sort of tone, I think, is just more a sense of, I think, people getting, you know, what's that, what's that phrase, high of their own supply and kind of really thinking too much about what, they, what they've got as being the, the sort of second coming when actually it is more of an evolution. Um, and a trend that I would like to see is people seeing it, w people actually um, who are developing these games thinking about the players first, not thinking about trying to justify and sell a technology that they have, which I think has been the biggest problem, is that you've got a lot of these VCs who are invested in these sorts of areas, and they see games as the ideal use case because people are already buying digital goods on a mass scale. And they're saying, well, why on earth wouldn't they want to own it? Without really understanding what gamers are about, which is, it is an escape, it is, it is fun, it is entertainment. Um, I think one of the reasons why Axie Infinity would, will never scale past those parts in Asia is because it makes such a minimal amount of money um, beyond that that you can't ever see somebody in the UK living off of, you know, farming in, uh, in these sorts of games as well. So there are plenty of lessons to be learned, but I, the one lesson should always be focus on making a really good, compelling game, and then you can build around that rather than c trying to justify ways of bringing in ownership. It, it does feel like up until now, you know, blockchain gaming has been about about user acquisition stats and money, inevitably. Do you think there's enough creativity, enough, enough quality sort of programming and skills and game making skills within the blockchain space right now? Uh, I'll, I'll also jump on this, uh, absolutely, 100%. I think all of the problems that people are talking about, they will be solved. So the things to do with, um, you know, um, is essentially getting rid of all of the technical terminology that surrounds this and making it much more player friendly. Um, so the more that you have to kind of, you know, talk in, in kind of code speak, the more people switch off. Um, so the fewer the acronyms, the better. <laughs> and, and when you're actually sort of selling this to, to players, you sell it to them with their, with their benefit in mind, which is about enjoying the game. So from that perspective, yes, I, I, I think that there's so much innovation in this space, a lot more than there has been in, um, in sort of traditional console and sort of mobile development. And this is, this is a space that's ripe for innovation, but it's also a space which has a level playing field, which is gonna always attract um, you know, more sort of players to it. So yeah, absolutely. I, I can say, I mean, so I, I think there's no, there's no sort of right or wrong way to make a blockchain game. And I think, you know, every sort of comp every games company who's looking at it sort of comes at it from, you know, from a different perspective. And I, I think that's sort of one, one of the problems with Axie was everyone sort, not everyone, but a lot of people thought that's the template, that's how we have to make the game, two tokens, NFTs, breeding, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's clearly, clearly not the case. And I think, um, you know, if you, I think it's good that Web2, sorry, we shouldn't use that term, I don't know. <laughs> Traditional games companies look at it and, and sort of think, these are the sort of games we make. You know, how, how, do, how does this, can this technology, you know, can that be useful in what we do? I mean, personally for me, I'm more interested in, in the more sort of crypto first degen weirdos who basically haven't made games before and just come at this and go, right, we're really into crypto, we love NFTs, what crazy kind of stuff can we do with smart contracts? Um, and I think that, I think the industry is, those sort of games are very hard to understand. They're very sort of niche often. Um, and I think the innovation that those guys have is often underrated by the general games um, industry because the general games industry has a very strong view on what a game is. And we sort of saw this a little bit with back when Free to Play Mobile came in and the whole kind of thing where they're skinner boxes, they're not games. And, and, and I think blockchain's that on steroids because these are just really crazy sort of things. And a sort of small example, I suppose, um, and it may seem very minor, but I think it is quite. Interesting. So the, of Yuga Labs, obviously well known for having the bored apes and, and the mutant apes um, kind of thing. And they've got this game going on at the moment. It's, I won't go into all the sort of law, and law is very important in blockchain for setting this stuff up and building a community. But basically, there's this very simple game, and it basically, uh, it's like Tempest. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's called um, uh, Dookie, what's it called? Dookie Dash. So it's like an endless runner, and the, the whole narrative is there's a radioactive key that's fallen down a sewer, and you have to, <laughs> your ape has to 
go down to, to, to collect it. And basically, it's, a, it's an endless runner, and you're basically collecting things and eventually bashing into things. And you have to have an NFT in order to play this game. And if you had a mutant ape or a board ape, you could basically got a, one of these um, NFTs called a sewer, a sewer pass, currently selling for about two ETH, I think, are the cheapest ones. Um, each, depending on the rarity, there's four different rarities. They have different multiplier on them. You can actually spend some ape coin, the cryptocurrency, to get some boosters for 10 minutes. And basically, you, run, you do this endless runner, and you get a score at the end. It's a big leaderboard with everyone playing. It's about 20,000 of these NFTs have been created. Um, and everyone's going to get a reward if they play the game. Um, so and there's this sort of clever thing going on there where the NFT, uh, the, the high score is sort of attached to the wallet that the NFT is in. So you can sell your sewer pass to someone, but then the high score is set to, reset to zero, so someone has to play it. But when the game ends in the 8th of February, the high scores are then attached to the NFTs. So there's no point in obviously selling the, the sewer pass then because the game is finished, but it has the high score attached to it. So people basically are now using their sewer passes to get better, people better than them to, you know, kids often <laughs> to get high scores. And then, then they'll be able to sell the high scores which will be attached to the NFT. And obviously the game theory that there is there will be one highest score then, and that's the, that's the that player will get the, this mystical key. No one knows what it is, how it fits into the Yuga Labs, you know, metaverse sort of thing, but, but you can just see, you know, is that a game? Well, no, to most of us, it's not a game we would particularly want to play, but it is an interesting game theory game that has lots of different elements, sort of orth orthogonal to what's going on, and obviously it has value around it, so that, that NFT super pass that has the top high score on it, that has this, is going to win the key, is going to be worth, obviously, a considerable amount of money. So, that sort of stuff really interests me, and I think that is innovation, because you're thinking about assets in a very specific way, and maybe the game is sort of a secondary, sort of gamified ex experience around that. But I think that that sort of stuff, you know, over the next decade will become part of, of sort of more broad, broad um, you know, mainstream gaming. And I find that sort of stuff fascinating, even though that's clearly not going to be the mainstream in the next year. And, and meanwhile, we've got, you know, all these other studios, more traditional studios, who are crunching away, trying to get stuff out. And, you know, hopefully in the process being creative as well. But I, I agree with John. There's, there's been a lot of Extraordinary creativity, really. Do we, do we feel like, um, can there ever be a sustainable play-to-earn system where everyone's happy, it's balanced, it makes sense, it can go on forever, or is it always going to be involved in some sort of thrive, dive, loop of, of, of success followed by failure? I think it's some utopian future, possibly. <laughs> yeah, it's a... That's a, that's, a, that's a big question. Um, I certainly wouldn't be putting my focus on uh, play to earn right now. Um, I think if you look back at games that have very, very large economies with you know, millions of players each day generating billions of dollars a year, there are always um, players within that system that aren't happy because they're feeling a grind, they're feeling a, a need to kind of constantly spend. And with play to earn it really relies on having a constant influx of new users coming in um, because if you don't have those new users coming in you've got no one to really sell to or you've got no way of of kind of expanding the sort of user base um, the other thing that 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 I just wanted to sort of pick up on which, which was mentioned in the sort of previous one is um, when the focus is on selling something you instantly I wouldn't even say just as a gamer, just as a person, kind of feel like, is this, is this, is this really what I want to be involved with? Like, is this just a, someone selling me stuff, or is this something that I want to enjoy? So that kind of point around, you know, we can add provenance and and sort of history to a to an NFT, and that can increase its value, which means I can then look forward to kind of selling it for more. If the intention is to sell and to constantly keep selling, when you when you sort of raise these, you're going to end up in a situation where um, people are just going to get Kind of, kind of zoned out with it, and, and if your intention actually, and, and this is something that we're focusing on with one of the games that we're working on, which is um, uh, play to own, or, or sort of play and own, the expectation shifts. The expectation is not that I will make money from this, I'm doing this because I just want to own a piece of a game that I really love. The way that I always go back to it is to say, imagine your favorite game right now, FIFA, whatever it might be, imagine that you could own a piece of that, and that's the kind of dream. But that doesn't appeal to all the people who play that game. It appeals to the people who are you know, very, very engaged with it as well. So those are the types of users that you're really looking to attract. And where I kind of see um, this all kind of ending up is that it will make uh, ownership a really strong element in 
what are your traditional franchises and games that are that are big now, but it's not going to take over. It's not going to suddenly replace them. It's it it, it is going to be an evolution in the next say five to ten years, but it's going to have to be a focus on the expectation of you owning without actually earning something from it. The moment you put that emphasis on earning, then the entire game becomes just a place for you to work and just to make more from. And the moment that your expectations are dashed, which is a problem with a lot of projects right now, is that they promise a lot. Even with the Yuga Lab stuff, this element of mystery sounds really cool. But the problem is when you raise expectations for gamers, or, or, or sort of when you say something like, okay, we're gonna re reveal what this is, gamers' expectations are already through the roof. You'll never be able to meet them. You'll always end up with disappointment. And so you always, you create this environment where you're kind of almost screwing yourself. So you've got to be very transparent with players to tell them what the purpose of this thing is so that if they are going to make an investment into it, they know clearly what it's about. So I think that, that kind of, more of that certainty is sort of needed, less of the live experimentation with real value for players because the only people you're really gonna attract are people who are already in that community people outside it aren't, aren't necessarily going to be involved, especially after the last year. So, But I, I, no, I sort of disagree with that a little bit. I mean, I, I, I agree with the earning for stuff. I mean, the, the play-to-earn thing I, was a term I never liked and was a bit upset when Sky Movie started using it. Um, but um, I think there is... I mean, the thing about blockchain is there is always value attached to these things. I mean, that's sort of... The, I mean, that is sort of, you know, is that the feature or the bug? Um, but the interesting thing about, say, you know, Bored Apes, they were, basic, they were basically given away. So... They've given away, now they're very valuable. They've created a community around that, and we're talking blockchain about community a lot. Um, and part of that is about, you know, if you, if you I, mean, I just, just happened to know a guy who was chatting to him the other day, he said, oh yeah, I just sold 10 board apes. And I was just like, what, how do you have 10 board apes? Um, you know, and, and, and clearly he's part of that community because he's made a lot of money from it. But that's not the only reason, because if everyone was, say we board apes now, if everyone had one of these assets that's worth $100,000 and they, just wanted to get hundred thousand dollars, they would they would sell them, and clearly they don't. So you know the fact these things have value is sort of subtly interesting because it it creates um, ownership, it creates community. But these people, the the, the only, being part of the, the, that community at the moment for most people is more important than the money because otherwise they would sell it off. So so you, so something interesting happens, and I think we sort of sometimes get the reverse. We we look at it top down, and we go these things are worth hundred thousand dollars, and Paris Hilton's just bought one. This is terrible. But you sort of forget they were. The value was created by people getting them effectively for free, and you know, the community, you know, and market forces created that, and that's I think very valuable. And what sorry, getting onto it. What I was going to disagree about is I think sometimes the mystery about not knowing what these things, what is going to happen in the future, is sort of actually the the sort of part of the community. And I don't think you can, maybe you can, maybe people always expect too much, but I think actually Yuga Labs is a great example of people who sort of you know lucked out and made some, made some not very good artwork about apes, but have then built this cl sort of classic narrative sort of thing about what's going on, and obviously they've had a lot of help and built these things out, and it's sort of fascinating what they're trying to do, and maybe, you know, it's not for everyone, clearly, this sort of, it's very juvenile sort of humour, but it is fascinating that, 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 you know, they come up with these things, and it's, you know, what's this key going to be? No one knows, I mean, um, so, so that's, that's there, is a, there is an advantage there, I think, I, I wouldn't say just sort of... yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, for full Keep disclosure, I do own a board ape. Oh, so, um, <laughs> I, 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 but uh, I agree with the community aspect. But the emphasis in your communicate if you're a, if you're a studio that's working on these sorts of games, you, the more you make it about earning potential, the the worse off you're going to be in the long run. Because especially if you've got tokens in your game that you don't really have any control over, um, you're going to end up in a situation like 99% of all the projects that have happened last year. Um, so for me, it's just more of an emphasis in your external communications around the ownership aspect rather than the earning aspect. And the more that you do that, the more it sets expectations for anybody being involved that, that that's what they want to do. And for example, with something like Board Ape, like if you, if, you, if you want to take that further to actual gamers, you will have to change how you behave with them versus the current community. Because the current community, if they lose money here or there, given the entry level to get into this sort of stuff, if you weren't there at the very beginning, they're not gonna be as hurt by it, right? But if you're talking about the average gamer that is looking in, into this and going, well look, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 is, is sort of uh, a lot to spend for me, their expectations are different to, hey, surprise me tomorrow. It's like, no, I don't want a random surprise next week. So um, I think in order for it to expand, you have to have a lot of the habits that you see with Games like Fortnite, games like FIFA, which 
people spend hundreds of thousands of dollars in each year, but they also have a level of certainty around what what's going to happen with it. So that was the only point. Can I just, can I just pick up on um, on play to own, and I'm with you, and we, we play and play and own. Um, and what's what's going to happen in these economies is, like, for example, look at racing games. Um, if someone's, someone's playing Gran Turismo, you know, after a while, everybody's got a Lamborghini and everybody's got a Ferrari. But in the real world, that's not how it happens, and those, that's one of the reasons those cars are more valuable. And it'll be the same in, on the blockchain. There are only going to be, say, 100 GTOs ever. And so if the whole racing metaverse increases, then those things will have real value. I was going to say, and, and clearly I think the advantage for games compared to sort of these high-end NFT projects is most game assets, even if there are NFTs, are going to be, you know, ten, you know, five, five dollars, you know, dollar, ten, you know, clearly there's going to be a pyramid and some of them will be very valuable. Imagine in your, in your game, you, you hope eventually some will be worth tens of thousands of dollars. But if you're having it's those NFTs, yeah, 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 so, but, but the, the, the interesting thing about games is I think it does give this entry-level element where, you know, whether it's an NFT or not, no one really cares really at, at that level and, but there is a sort of a, you know, a way in which people who really care about having a GTO will write, that's, that sort of, you know, that's what I want. Um, yeah, so, so, so I think games allow you to sort of have a stratified um, uh, sort of a value system in a way that sort of these big NFT sort of projects don't because they're, this is the floor. <laughs> just, uh, we, we've told blockchain, we've told NFTs a lot there. I just want to bring in the, 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 other, the other third element of, of mystery and darkness, the, 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 um, the metaverse. And do we feel like the metaverse, whereabouts does it connect with blockchain these days? What is, what's, 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 does there have to be a connection at all? Yeah, personally, I think it's overhyped and not necessarily. Um, I think we've all been living in the metaverse for the last couple of decades. Um, there's, some of you might know of William Gibson who wrote um, Neuromancer and invented the term cyberspace. And I, I heard him interviewed, and his concept was of a fully immersive internet. And he was asked, aren't you a bit disappointed that hasn't really turned out that way? And he said, well, you just look what people do. They, they, they sit in front of 2D screens, and they seem really engaged. And so I, I think that that's it. But also, I think what the internet has given us is the ability to connect at, um, at distance. So, in many ways, we're there. I don't think 3D is necessary. I don't think blockchain is necessary. Probably an enabler so that the economy develops more. Uh, fantastic point, which, which um, I, I kind of read a quote somewhere, which was that you know, the metaverse isn't a place, it's a moment in time where we spend more of our lives in a digital sphere than we perhaps do in, in the sort of real world. Um, and I agree with that notion. We spend more of our lives in a sort of digital uh, environment, but that digital environment still has a physical connection because you're looking at people that you have some relationship with. Um, so I, I don't I don't buy into the you know um, you know meta creating a metaverse which is separate from another metaverse which is whatever. It's they're just companies competing for that space. Um, I think we're already there. It's just a case of right now we're going through a period of. Um, elevated development where you're trying to get more functionality, more immersion in what would traditionally be a very passive experience. When you're seeing things on a mobile device, you're kind of consuming, you're reading, but when you're walking down the road and, and you know, you're constantly looking at your phone, make sure that you're look, going down the right way, there are, there are still steps to take to make it clearer, but we're already there. It's just a case of developing the technologies that would immerse you more within it. Um, and I don't think it's a single thing. It's, 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 it's really just, um, you know, in the same way as like when you go into the internet, there's not a single internet, uh, you know, page that you go to which has everything. You've got your Amazons, you've got your Googles, you, you've got your, your chat GPTs now as well. So you've got everything. Um, and it's the same way as it's, as it's, as it's going to be now. I don't think anybody here has a dream to live in sort of Zuckerberg's um, uh, a meta, meta environment. So. I think it was it sort of uh, more than interesting, it's sort of quite relevant that the term metaverse was created in a book, Snow Crash, from Neil Stevenson. So, I mean, I kind of think by, by, by the very definition it was created in a book, it sort of is, it is a sort of concept that can never be sort of created in the way it was shown in the book, because that's the point of a book is it plugs straight into your brain and, and nothing we could do with all the technology or all the 
strapping things onto people is going to be the same as reading that in a book because <laughs> that's the sort of the, 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 that's the sort of the, uh, the way the brain works. Um, I, I do think, I mean, I, I think you know, it's, it's sort of a meaningless term that only, sort of only has meaning because it's sort of so meaningless in, in a way. But um, you know, I, I do think you probably, for me, the success, to have a successful metaverse, it will need to have blockchain and UGC, and it will need to be that sort of decentralized thing. Going back to your Zuck thing, um, you know, this, it, anything that's centralized and that sort of thing, I just don't think will scale, and people won't be interested in it. And the, but on that, you know, I, I do one one thing I think is interesting in 2023 is how the sandbox works, which I, you know, I quite like the sandbox. I know the guys there quite well. Uh, and I do, not to belittle it, I do think of it as sort of my first metaverse. But, but mm. It has some metaverse type things, um, particularly the blockchain bit and the UGC stuff, if they can bring that off. I think that will be an interesting project to, you know, can it coalesce a community around that that is sort of creating these little game spaces, these little interesting things. And obviously Roblox, you could say, is yeah, Fortnite, yeah, they're all sort of metaverses, but this one has a bit more openness to it. So is that enough to sort of really, you know, interest people? So we're going to have to wind it up pretty soon. I'm going to put, the, put this thought in your minds. Are there any questions from the audience? I've got a whole bunch of stuff here. We could, we could talk for hours. But if there's anybody in the audience that wants to ask anything right now? Well, no, we'll keep rumbling on. I'll, uh, we, fantastic. Microphone on the way to you. Great. Hi, I'm Chris and Claire from Hadian. Uh, we're looking at potentially helping build a platform for other developers to build a sort of open metaverse. And it sounds like over the past 18 months, two years, you know, you've been quite involved in building out game, get new projects. Uh, but starting from a, I know I want to integrate Web3. One of the things that seems to be a theme over the last couple of days is, hey, if you take Web3 and make that front and center, that's not really resonating. You kind of want to pull it back a bit. But I'm interested to understand what impact that's had more from a game design aspect, how it's impacted sort of game mechanics, knowing that you're going to be bringing Web3 in, does it impact the way you're approaching game design even at all? Or is it something that you're going, hey, actually, we can integrate it quite naturally and that's how you're going about doing it? What I could say briefly is um, within the design of our, our racing game, it's called Nitro Nation World Tour, it's, it's, it's a proper game. Um, but then a lot of thinking has had to go into the economy because we'd be talking about um, play and own. And there are a lot of implications of that. And so um, it, it takes a lot of work to do that. Yeah, absolutely. In the design of the game, you have to um, think about these things because ownership is something that's new that hasn't been there perhaps previously, or certainly the idea that it can stay on for a, a lot longer than, than whenever the sort of game developer decides to shut down the game. But um, in the same way as, you know, we don't talk about HTML or JavaScript with the internet, right? It's, it's, it's sort of long gone, but it was there at a time when it was first, first coming in. You need to get rid of all of the um, terminology that you use in the back end, and you, and you need to make it friendly. So if you are, at this, in this day and age, still touting NFTs as a USP in your game, you're doing something wrong. Because it isn't a USP, it's always existed, and you should frame it in, in an entirely different way, which is something that's a lot more user-friendly. So I think that's, that's the point that maybe you're hearing from other people, but certainly uh, for me, in, in terms of the sort of games that we're working on, for us it is completely hidden away. It is not something that is useful to a consumer to be able to know about and to understand. And if they want to engage, then it's brought in at a time when it's relevant for them, um, rather than bombarding, you know, 90% of people who would never really even engage with it in the first place as well. I'll say, if you, if you want to see how, read how complicated it is, I would read, read the white paper, read the Nitro Nation white paper, which is very interesting about how they have integrated NFTs, particularly how they're using it for guilds and community, I would say. Any other, any other questions in the... Hey, we have to wrap it up. Damn, okay, I've got questions for, questions for days here. Thanks for coming, fellas. That was great. Uh, yes, sir, Paul and John, of course. Give them a big round of applause. Thank you for that. Thank you.